Hey, I want you right next to me. Seats open. I'm coming. You know it's my favorite. Come here. My chair, your chair. Okay, don't cross the bear. I don't want your freezing feet touching me. So sit in your chair. Don't eat cookie for you again tonight. Man, you deserve it. I love you. Okay, we're having chimichurri beef stuffed peppers. <laughs> you're the only one who can make me eat healthy, but if you're making it, I'm gonna eat it because I love you. How are you liking the dinner I made? Yeah, how, how much salt did you use? Um, I don't know, like just a dash? Okay, well, how about next time we just do a door dash? Stop it! Okay, phones, phones in the middle, okay? No phone time. Wait, I wanna make sure we're getting quality time. How was your day? Did you get the meme I just sent you? <laughs> yeah, that was a good one. <laughs> Babe, I've started like compiling our songs. I made you a playlist. We love John Mayer, so I've been working on this. I just texted you uh, a to-do list. So check your phone. Sweetheart, I'm gonna grab some coffee. Do you want anything? Do you want your usual, or do you want to change it up this time? I just want to make sure you feel loved and served. Ooh, I'm hungry. Oh, what'd you get me? Oh, I only got a sandwich for me. I forgot about it. Should I go back and get... I'm so sorry. All right, well, what a way to kick things off with some people getting dunked and seeing that all. That's what it's all about, right? That's why we do what we do. And so how cool, what a great way to start off our service. Hey, really glad that you're here. Uh, if we never met, my name is Mark, and uh, I'm one of the pastors here on staff. And uh, I recently came across this true story of some women that went on like this, this ladies weekend. And uh, during that weekend, they challenged each other. And they said, when is the last time you told your husband that you loved him? Well, at that moment, they all decided to text their husband the same message. I love you, sweetie. Here are some actual responses from their husbands. Uh, one husband said this, who the hell is this? <laughs> Another one said, I love you too, what's wrong? <laughs> Did you wreck the car again? <laughs> I don't understand what you mean. And then my favorite one, I thought we agreed you wouldn't drink during the day. <laughs> well, today we are in week two of our series, The Struggle is Real, where we are looking at some, some real struggles we all have that have a huge impact on our lives. And our tendency when we struggle is to avoid or hide from the struggles because we don't like to struggle. But we've been talking throughout the series is that struggle is actually a good thing. Because struggle leads to growth, and it leads to healing, it leads to freedom, it leads to breakthrough. And we just believe that the best place to struggle is right here in the local church, because if you follow Jesus, a big part of following Jesus is learning how to struggle well. And so we just think we ought to do this together. And so last week as we kicked it off, I gave everybody permission to just kind of leave the, I gotta feel like I have my act together, I know it all, all that stuff, just kind of leave that at the door and giving you permission and giving us permission to struggle. Now, last week, we kicked it off with a big one. I struggle with my identity. Now, today, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about a struggle that many of us are experiencing every single day. The struggle is real in my marriage. Now, I want to begin with some startling statistics about marriage in our country. The divorce rate of, in our country is just over 50%, which has actually gone down over the last 10 years because more couples are cohabitating. Rather than getting married, they don't wanna go through a divorce. Uh, what's interesting is that a study was just released that couples that cohabitate and then get married, uh, actually the divorce rate is higher than 50%, which is kind of interesting in itself. Uh, here's another interesting stat. Average length of a marriage that ends in divorce is this, eight years eight years. And the top three most common things that are driving divorce right now are this, money, infidelity, and incompatibility, which is interesting because all three of these things are preventable. Now, I really think that there are two primary things that are driving these stats and thus making marriage a struggle. Uh, I think the first one is this, is that it's, I call it our stuff we bring into our, our marriage, that every single one of us has a story and our story includes our family of origin, and our story includes our experiences, whether good or bad. Uh, I'll have couples come up to me, and I've had this a ton just being a pastor, and they said, hey, we're having marriage struggles or married problems. And I'll say, a marriage problem is really this, he snores too much or she squeezes the toothpaste in the middle. What you don't realize is that you are having single people problems. You see, you, you brought your stuff into the relationship and they brought their stuff into the relationship and your unresolved stuff combined with their unresolved stuff is creating the stuff. And when this happens, our tendency is to just focus on the other person's stuff. 
But the reality is, is that every single one of us brings stuff into a relationship. Here's an interesting stat. Did you know that 90% of the relationship struggles, in a, a, a relationship struggles stem from things that were brought into the relationship, not things that happened in the relationship? And so our actions and our behavior, they come out of our hurt and brokenness or our false expectations or our reactions to maybe experiences we've had in past relationships or even our family of origin. Here's the second thing that I think is driving those stats. I I think it's, I call it believing the lie that marriage is meant to make me happy. That our marriage should just be one big chick flick or you may call it romantic comedy, whichever one that you choose to use on that one. And that there just should be constant romance in in our marriage and there should be just all bubble gum and kisses and there should be love songs playing every single day in our house that we're we're married. And so we just believe that, you know, this should be what marriage looks like. You know, when we're dating, think about this. Things just come so easy doesn't it? I mean, it's like, you know, you're dating and you're, you're on a date and man, you're just talking and you're talking for hours and you're talking about everything. And then you fall in love and it just feels like falling in love is just so easy. And then you talk about the wedding and wedding planning and then you have the wedding day and then, you know, on that wedding day, it's like, we're going to commit to, to living our lives together. We will always be happy because I married my soulmate. Well, then you fast forward a few years. Now, If you have a date night, instead of going to a nice restaurant, you go to Subway and you get subs. You don't even eat at the restaurant. You take them to go. And then you have kids and kids change everything. It's like he decides to go away on a quiet weekend hunting and she's left home getting up at 2 a.m. in the morning, cleaning up poopy diapers and crib sheets. And then the dogs run around still chewing on the furniture as the dog always does. And then you add to that. Just all the fights about money and how to discipline kids and troubled in-laws and work frustrations and communication breakdown and then the frequency of sex and this is the big one right here and then the different ways you define what clean means. Now this was a big one. I'll be honest with you, this is a real big one for for Donna and me. Uh, I really believe clean meant you clean the bathroom once a month. She, for clean, meant once a week. And I thought, how extreme is she, you know? But here's what ends up happening. You wake up one day and you realize he doesn't make me happy. She doesn't make me happy. You know what? I just don't love you anymore. And you know what? Maybe I just married the wrong person. Maybe this marriage needs to come to an end. But you feel that way. And the reason you feel that way is because your happiness is the driving factor for determining if your marriage is going in the right direction. And you know why that is? That's the Hollywood narrative. It's why in, in chick flicks, the movie ends shortly after the, after the wedding because the life-to-life struggles that, that couples experience, they just don't sell all that well. That's why, you know, for some of us, you know, we think, well, I'm just not feeling it to my, I'm not feeling it for my spouse. That must be a problem. No, you're just married. Now, as long as you believe, believe those two lies, believe those lies, two things are going to happen. The first one is, is your marriage will always be about you because it'll always be about what you get out of it. And if that's the case for you, do you know what that's called? Selfishness. And I have never seen a selfish relationship last. And the second thing that will happen is that your relationship will be very, very transactional. It'll be, hey, you know, I'll do for you if you do for me because I need you to do for me because I need you to make me happy once again. That's not a relationship that will last because love is not transactional. Chip Ingram, in his book, Marriage That Works, he tells the story of how he and his wife, Teresa, they met. And eventually they got married, but it didn't take long for his stuff to start to surface. And Chip grew up in a very dysfunctional home. His father was an alcoholic. And so he just didn't have a picture of what a healthy marriage should look like. Well, her stuff, Uh, started to surface really early as well, that Teresa had been married before and uh, her husband had had left her for another woman and just didn't leave her, but they also left uh, their two infant twins together. And so it didn't take long for their marriage just to dive south really quickly. And they would read books and they went to conferences and they went to counseling, but nothing worked for them. Today, Chip and Teresa have been happily married for over 30 years 
And here's what Chip says saved their marriage. He, he says this. He says, the fundamental reason that we are still together and have the kind of marriage that I always dreamed of, still with normal struggles, is that we learn God's design for the marriage relationship. And then this end part, and we committed to following it. One of the clearest pictures, or the clearest picture that God gives for his design for marriage is actually written by the Apostle Paul in the book of Ephesians. And we looked at a passage in the book of Ephesians last week. We're going to do it again this week. And so we're going we're gonna, to, at the beginning of this section that Paul talks about when he talks about in marriage, Paul kicks it off by talking about how God designed marriages to flourish. And here's the thing. This will work in any marriage. Here, here's what Paul says. He says, submit to one another out of reverence, not for the other person, out of reverence for Christ. And so he uses this word submit. And submit just means this. I'm here for you. That the other person's best over my best. And so Paul says, hey, if you think marriage is going to be about your needs and your wants and your happiness, you just need to know you're going to be severely disappointed because God designed marriage to be a place for us to meet another person's need. Now, if you're single and you hope to someday be married, I hope you'll just kind of let this sink in because I, I just want you to know this is what marriage is designed to be. Are you willing, are you willing to, to give yourself for, truly give yourself for another person? Are you willing to give up your wants for another person's needs? Are you willing to mutually submit to another person? That's God's design for marriage. And here's the thing, mutual submission is the only way that I've seen marriage work. Now, let me skip down to, to the end of this passage that Paul writes. And here's what he, he ends with. And this is so powerful. He says this, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. And so Paul is quoting the second chapter in the entire Bible, Genesis 2, where God institutes marriage. And he said, okay, here's God's idea. That you will leave one family, and you'll cling to your spouse, and then you will start a new family. And that through sex... That's a physical example of you becoming one with the other person because you are spiritually becoming one with the other person. And here's what else is happening, and we, we don't think about this one. We aren't just becoming one with the other person. We are also becoming one with God. And then he, he, he ends with this. He says, this is a profound mystery. And it's like, what, Paul? The whole sex and oneness idea? And Paul goes, no, 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 not that. So much more than that. And he says, this is the profound mystery but I am talking about Christ and the church, which is interesting is because we think marriage and our marriage is about uh, my story and the other person's story together. And Paul goes, uh, 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 uh. It is way bigger than that. That the mystery of marriage is that it's a picture of the eternal relationship that exists between Jesus and his church, which if you're a follower of Jesus, that's you. And so the mystery is Jesus actually weds himself to us. This is why Jesus is called the bridegroom and we are called the bride. And so if you really want to fully understand God's design for marriage, we need to better understand what, this, what the larger story that marriage is meant to point to. This is why we don't need to take our cues from Hollywood or we don't take our cues from the other person or we don't even take our cues from our story and all the stuff that we bring in. That we need to learn to take our cues from God. And as we do that, we understand this. This is how God loves me. And so as I look at that other person, this is how I was designed to love them. And this is what Chip and Teresa figured out. It saved their marriage. And honestly, uh, this is what saved my marriage to, to my wife, Donna, that for the first few years, um, we had just a brutal, brutal marriage. And uh, even after the first year, uh, first three months, honestly, I, I thought we had talked about just calling it quits because things were just so bad for us. And uh, we, we finally had to get to the point. And uh, this passage right here and understanding of mutual submission and all that stuff, this is for us, even to this day, what saved our marriage. And as a pastor, I've talked to just more couples than, than I, can, I can count and that were in tough water 
in tough place, and this is what saved their marriage. And if you're here and you are struggling or you're watching and you're struggling in your marriage, it can save your marriage too. A few weeks ago, I, uh, I was listening to this guy as he was talking about relationships. And he said something pretty fascinating. He said a big part of a couple's relationship is actually found around this word right here, yes. It's like, think about this. Do you want to go out? Yes. Do you want to go out again? Yes. Hey, do you love me? Yes. Do you want to get married? Yes. Do you take this person to be your husband or your wife? Yes. Do you want to get a pug? Heck no. Do you want to get a kitty cat? Yes. Do you want to have a family? Yes. With this word yes in mind, here's our big idea for, for our message today, and it's this. Saying yes on your wedding day, I mean, it's, it's easy stuff. But saying yes for the rest of your life, it's a different story. That's hard. And this is where many of you are right now. It's a struggle and it's hard. So the question is, how can we grow and flourish in our marriage through mutual submission in the way that God has designed it to be? And so with the rest of my time, here's what I want to do. I want to give you two commitments that I hope that you will say yes to. And because, as, as we said, saying yes for the rest of your life, it's hard, and so this is hard, but let me tell you something, it is so worth it. And what these two things are, these are actually foundational type things. I mean, you focus on these things right here, the other stuff becomes a lot easier. Now, for many of us, we focus on the other stuff, and we don't focus on the foundational part. And so we do it in reverse, but I'm going to challenge you. I want you to focus on these two things. Now, if, if you're not married, and you hope to be, Listen, do not settle for anyone who is not already committed to these two things. And if you're, if you're not going to be married again, you just chose, for what you I don't want to get married again. Listen, you're going to hear some things in, in what I talk about that you can use in any relationship. So two things that we want to go through. Here's the first one. I hope you'll say yes and commit to a Jesus-centered marriage. Uh, Jesus, at the end of his longest message, is known in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is comparing people that build their house on different foundations. And here, here's what he says to wrap it up. He says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them in the practice is like a wise man who built his house. And so when you see house, you just think of life, who built his life on the rock. And rock equals solid, unmovable. And so he's saying, you know, those who build their life on the life and teachings of Jesus, they're, they're on good ground. They're unmovable. And then he says, the rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Now I want you to notice, Jesus is not saying if the storms come. He is saying when they come. You see, you're going to go through storms in your marriage, and, and those storms are going to be really, really hard. And they're going to impact your marriage. And some of those storms may last seasons of your life. And if you're a parent, you know this. Parenting is challenging. And if one of your kids has, has a health or behavior issue, that just adds additional stress on your marriage. Uh, one of our kids uh, has a, a mental disorder called reactive attachment disorder. And the short of that is that they are not able to connect with other people, in, including us. And not only is she not able to connect, but she just, uh, just destroys any relationship when it gets to a certain point. And uh, it really, she really takes it out on the caregivers, and so it, it's a constant uh, internal fight with, with Donna and me, and so we don't have many easy weeks. Uh, it, it's a struggle, it's been hard on our marriage, and it continues to be hard on our marriage. And uh, we talk to other couples that have similar situations, reactive attachment disorder kids, and they'll just talk about the same thing, just the, the pounding it is on their marriage. But there are storms that your relationship is, is going to experience. Some of those storms are just the loss of parents or the loss of finances, the loss of jobs, the loss of health. Or for, for many of us, we don't realize the storm of transitioning from one stage of life to another. Or here's a real common one. Every marriage goes through seasons where you just don't feel that strongly about that other person. It's a very normal thing. But the couple, 
that chooses to build their house on the solid foundation of Jesus, when those storms hit, their marriage will not fall. Uh, Brad Wilcox is a, is a leading sociologist at the University of Virginia, studies tons of couples. And uh, he, he did a study recently, and it found that couples that go to a Bible-believing church, and so not just any church, but a church that, that believes and teaches the Bible, that that couple has a 35% chance, less chance, of getting a divorce than ones that don't. Uh, there was also another study recently done by the National Association for Marriage Enrichment. And it found that couples that pray together on a regular basis, read their Bible together on, on a daily basis, the divorce rate for those couples is less than, check this out, 1%. Think about this, national average of 50% down to one or less than 1%. And so if, if you're a couple that's struggling, or maybe not struggling, okay, if you're not, and you want to build a stronger foundation, and please, I'm not saying this as a pastor, even though I am a pastor. Research shows, commit to being in church together. Read the Bible together. Begin to pray for your marriage. Watch what God does. And it makes sense, because if he, if he designed it, it makes sense to get him involved in it. Now, I think there's another reason why those stats are the way they are. And I want to show you this by showing you a picture. And I used to think this picture was kind of cheesy, but now that I'm married and I just seen the truth of it, now I don't think it's cheesy anymore. Maybe you've seen this picture before. Here it is right here. Uh, it's this picture of this triangle with God on the top, you know, and then you have uh, the husband and the wife on, on, on separate sides of, e of each other. Now, I, as you look at that picture, uh, what happens as each of, uh, e each of them begins to draw closer to God? What, what ends up happening? Well, I'll show you in the next picture. Here it is right here. What ends up happening? What is their position with each other? Closer. You see, as they draw closer to God, that gap between them gets shorter and they get closer to each other. And so I know it's kind of a simple drawing, but I think it's a really, really profound uh, illustration. That as we get closer to God, that your intimacy with your spouse will actually get deeper. Now, I know there's some couples that don't follow Jesus and they would say, you know, we, we're happy. And you know what? I wouldn't argue with that. But I would say this, are you as happy as you could be emotionally, physically, and spiritually? And you know what I would argue? That they're not. But I also know Jesus following couples that would say the very same thing. Second thing that I hope you'll say yes to I want you to commit to this. Commit to a covenant-keeping marriage. Now, for most of us, the reality is, is that when it comes to our marriage, it's more of a contractual-keeping marriage. Because for, for most of us, we still believe the lie that marriage is there to make us happy. Now, you know this is going on in your marriage when you have this constant back and forth of let's make a deal going on. All right, it's kind of like this. Hey, if you do this, then I'll do this. Hey, if you, start, if you stop yelling, then I'll start listening. Hey, if you go to counseling, then I'll start taking medication. Hey, listen, if you're nice, then I'll reward you later, if you know what I mean. You know, if you do this, then this. But here's the problem with a contractual relationship. You see, I'm only there as long as you keep your end of the deal. Or I don't like the terms of this deal. I'm going to change the terms because you know what? I want a brand new deal. Now, let me go back and read the, these words from the book of Genesis that I, that I read earlier because you're going to see in these words that God, God's design all along was, it for, was us to be in a covenant relationship with another person. Here, here's what the writer of Genesis says. He says this, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and they will become one flesh. And that word that's used for united means soldered or cemented together. Cemented physically, emotionally, and spiritually. In other words, we're connected to that other person. We're connected to our spouse through a covenant relationship. Not let's make a deal. Not as long as you make me happy. Not let's try this out. A covenant relationship. And a covenant is nothing more than a lasting, binding obligation to another person. 
Or as I like to say it this way, I'm not going anywhere. Now, let me just speak to married couples for a minute. Now, if, if, if you're here and uh, you, you've gone through a divorce, and some of you have, uh, and, and some of you, 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 you didn't want that to happen, and you did whatever you could to save it, but you can't control another person's decisions, listen, we love you, we're glad that you're here, and we want to encourage you to, if you've never gone through divorce care, I want to encourage you to go through divorce care, to let just God just heal your heart from that experience. And you can go to the next steps room, next steps area for, for, for you to do that. Now, for some of you, you're in an abusive relationship and it's physically abusive. You just need to get out of that thing and seek safety right away. And some of you are in an abusive relationship, but it's not physical, it's, it's other ways. You just need to know this, that sometimes the most loving thing to do is to set up the proper boundaries and those proper boundaries include you being separate from that person for a period of time. But if you're married and you are struggling and you're struggling in your marriage, here, here's, here's what I want to encourage you to do. I want, I want to encourage you to be willing to say yes and to continue to say yes to that promise in sickness and in health. And, and I want you to say, you know what, I'm not going anywhere because we're in this together and sure things are hard, and sure things are difficult, and we're really struggling with this, but you know what? You are worth fighting for, and we're going to do this together. Let me tell you something. You do that. You will experience a richness and a history with someone that you can't experience anywhere else. Melanie Shamal, in her book, The Antelope in the Living Room, she actually writes about the story of how her and her husband Perry met. And then they got married, and then they were married for about five years, and uh, they decided that they were going to start having a family. And then I, I want you to just listen to her story in, in her own words. And uh, I, as, as I read this story, for some of you, um, this is your story. A big part of this was Donna and me's story. But I want you to listen to, to, to her story. She, she writes this, We were in our early 30s, and it seemed like the right time to start a family. At least, at least that's what our parents kept telling us. I got pregnant, and then I had a miscarriage. Perry and I were heartbroken, but I think these things affect women differently. While we both experienced a loss, it was something that happened inside my body between the hormones and the sadness, something shifted in me. Depression settled in, and I spent a lot of time wondering how soon I could go back to bed. She then writes, I can almost draw a line between before miscarriage and after miscarriage. We had had financial struggles and other problems in our first five years of marriage, but this was the first thing that we couldn't decide just to buck up and be positive. About the morning of my DNC, Perry drove me to the hospital and was right there holding my hand before I went in. He was there when I woke up, and because he knows my love language, on the way home, he drove me through Shipley's to get a chocolate donut. She says, maybe it was the anesthesia, but I kept reaching for his hand and saying, I really love you. But I was speaking the absolute truth. I had never loved him more because up till that point, I didn't realize that, I had, that I'd ever been so aware of how much he loved me. It was the moment that I realized that he didn't just love me when I was fun or pretty or cooking spaghetti and meatballs. He loved me when I was hurting and depressed and wearing the same pajamas four days in a row. It sounds weird to say after five years of marriage, but it was the first time I realized that he was going to stick with me for better or for worse. I read that story, and I want that from Donna. She wants that from me. And you know, I, I just think every single person wants that. Every single person wants to be loved, and they want to know that they are loved no matter what. That even when we're not at our best, even when we're at our worst, I love you no matter what. That's a covenant. And that's God's design for our marriage. That even when the feelings aren't there and even when we're not making each other happy and even when we think we're not getting our needs met and even when everything in me wants to leave this thing, I'm not going anywhere because I love you. What if you were to commit to that today? I'm telling you, if you would be willing to say yes to that, here's what you're going to discover. Saying yes on your wedding day is easy but saying yes for the rest of your life 
Man, is it hard. And the struggle is real in the midst of that hard. But it is more than worth it. Now, I, I realize that I have, can't talk about everything in, in marriage in a 30-minute talk. And so what we've done is we've actually created a resource page for you. I encourage you to go on this, uh, all couples to go on this. I mean, I realize like one of the things we didn't talk about is conflict resolution, a big one. You'll find some things on this resource page. You'll also find some, I know for some of you, it, it's really important. You're in a place where the struggle is weird. You need a, the right outside voice to speak into your marriage. We've got Christian counseling recommendations in there. Uh, we've got some couple reading plans as we talked about uh, just the importance of that. And so that's in there. And uh, we have some options for some couples groups. My wife and I are in a couple group. It's just invaluable for us. There's nothing like being with other couples going, oh yeah, me too, me too, me too. You see, I know that if you say yes to these two things, these foundational things, the other stuff, that we think is the most important, the other stuff will become a lot easier. So here's how I want to close my time. Uh, if, if you're with someone else, you're a couple, married, engaged, hope to be married to them, whatever that may be, I want you to grab their hand for me for a minute. And I know for some of you couples, you haven't held hands in a long, long time. I just want you to do that now. And uh, as you do that, I want you to bow your head and close your eyes. And I just want to pray over all the couples. Uh, in our church and all those who are watching online. Father, um, it is easy to say yes. And um, we look at those, those rates of divorce and marriage fallout and marriage struggles, and uh, there was a point in all of them where it was like, yes, 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 yes. But God, um, we know that as important as love is, love isn't enough. Otherwise, every marriage would stay together. There's more to it than that. And so, Father, I would just pray over every couple here. I pray for the couples that are struggling right now that are maybe just like, we're done, we're done. I pray you would supernaturally step in and you would bring the right people around them. I pray that you would humble both of them, that they would be able to understand, you know what, I'm gonna take a risk here and I'm gonna, I'm gonna mutually submit and it's gonna start with me. And Father, I pray you'd save that marriage and uh, not just save it to keep it together, but you would breathe life and healing and flourishing into that marriage. God, uh, for those that are just kind of on cruise control, uh, Father, I, I pray that they would get together and go, no, no, we're not settling for that. That the covenant idea and the Jesus-centered marriage, it's a marriage of flourishing and vibrancy and passion and health and wholeness. God, uh, I pray you'd breathe life into them. And for the marriages that are doing great, God, may they never settle and uh, may you use them as an example and a barometer for the rest of us. That sure, it's hard. Sure, it's hard. But the fight and the struggle, it's worth it. It's worth it. Thank you, God, for, for all you're doing. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.